And let's begin. We are so pleased to have Jane Saltzman to talk about MIND, How the Hidden Rules of Ownership Control Our Lives. It's a book that he co-wrote with Michael Heller. It's been featured in the New York Times Book Review and the New Yorker Magazine. James, his, his resume is so vast and impressive. I'm gonna leave that up to our moderator, Wendy Reed. Wendy is, was starring in an NBC series when she volunteered to work with a six-year-old foster child. This experience inspired her to quit acting and attend law school. Wendy is now a licensed attorney with years of experience in foster care and nonprofit law. But for the past 10 years, she has developed an expertise in creating and organizing events with the purpose of convening people for high level conversations around systemic change. Her clients have included large multinational corporations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as smaller local corporations like the Montecito Journal. So to introduce James, please welcome Wendy Reed. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. I'm delighted to be here with you all, not only because Chaucer's holds such a huge place in my family's life, uh, but because Jim Salzman is a good friend and I've had the pleasure of knowing about his idea for this book for a number of years. And so to uh, read it and actually hold a copy in my hands and then to think about the questions that I want to ask him has just been a lot of fun. So let me start by introducing you to Jim Salzman. Jim is the Donald Bren Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law with joint appointments at the UCLA School of Law and the UCSB School of Environment. He's the author of Drinking Water, A History, which was featured in the New York Times, Nature, and Scientific American. Jim has degrees from Harvard and Yale and has taught at Columbia, Duke, Harvard, Stanford, and Yale Law Schools, and in Australia, China, Israel, Italy, Portugal, and Sweden. But perhaps his greatest achievement is that he and his wife, Heather, live here in Santa Barbara. So Jim, before we start, I just wanted to say a few words about the book. And I know that many of our participants tonight have not had the chance to read it yet. I know that they're gonna go right out to Chaucer's and buy a copy as soon as we're done here. But um, I realized I really couldn't sum it up any better than the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Jared Diamond. So let me just quote him here. Jared Diamond says, this delicious book will guide you through the confusing maze of ownership disputes that bedevil our daily lives. Who owns your private information, your Netflix password, your, yard, your yard's airspace, and the chair of your deceased parents that you and your sister now both want? It's often unclear, read and prepare yourself. So I also wanted to say congratulations on all the wonderful reviews you've been getting from the New Yorker to the New York Times. Um, it's, it's quite a hit and I know that's that must be a lot of fun for you. It's been great, thanks Wendy. Yeah, well, so let's just, let's just jump right in, Jim. Let's start at the beginning. What made you think of doing this book? How did you partner up with Michael Heller? And what's the story with the pie on the cover? Great, so, um, so as you said, I wrote a popular book uh, in 2012, basically about drinking water, sort of the different aspects of drinking water. And it was just such a fun experience doing public talks like this, going on radio and stuff, that I was looking around for another popular topic. And it's, it's, it's really hard to find a really good topic for a book. You go into a bookstore and you think, oh my God, you know, they've written about everything, right? Um, and so I was talking with a friend about a year or two later, and he just mentioned, you know, in passing, you know, it's funny that no one's ever written Freakonomics for ownership. And suddenly the proverbial ding went off. And I thought, you know, you're right. Because if, if you look at Freakonomics as an author, sort of structurally, what Freakonomics is doing is actually teaching very simple microeconomics, but it's doing it through very clever stories. Why do sumo wrestlers cheat? Why do drug dealers live with their mothers? Well, look at the individual incentives it all makes sense. Ownership is the exact same thing. Property theory is, I mean, the fancy way to describe this book is that it's, it's property theory made accessible. And it turns out that ownership just shapes all of our lives every day, almost every minute. You know, do you stand at the front of the line or the back? What you eat, what you drink, where you park, where you drive, all of that is shaped by ownership rules. We just don't think about it that way. And so when I got the idea, I thought I could write the book. I teach property law, but I'm an environmental guy. I'm not really a property property expert, but a friend of mine was. Uh, his name is Michael Heller. He teaches at Columbia Law School. Uh, and I got in touch with him and he was immediately all in. 
Uh, and it's been fun in the sense that most co-authored books, you know, say so you do this chapter, I'll do that chapter, et cetera, et cetera. And you do some light editing, but that's it. We didn't work that way. We swapped literally hundreds of drafts back and forth. And the goal was to get a single, a single narrative voice. So there are parts of the book where I know I, I got that phrase or, or he got that phrase, but most of the book, I actually can't tell you who wrote. That's funny because I actually was looking to see a tone <laughs> change, you know, to see if I could figure out which chapters you wrote. And I was just going to say, it's really seamless. You do a, you both do a, a brilliant job of making it appear at least that there's one author. Okay, but so now why the pie? Oh, the, the, the pie. So the pie cover. So I, one of the things you get as an author, if you if you if you if you've written a successful prior book, is some say in the cover. The first book, they just said, "Here's the cover." I said, "Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you for that." Um, so this one originally, the, the original, um, the original illustration for this book was two hands holding the arms of a teddy bear, which to me is like terrifying. Yeah. Right, because you know how that's going to end up, and it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be pretty. So he said, "No, no, no, thank you." Um, the second draft had a stamp that said "mine" with an exclamation point on it. We thought that's a little aggressive, and the third one was was the cherry pie, but it was just a piece of cherry pie. And Michael came up with the idea of putting a fork into the cherry pie, and it's you know it raised a lot of interesting questions, right? So I mean, for for, for folks who are listening, when you were growing up. Who got the last piece of dessert? How did your parents decide who gets the last piece of dessert? Was it someone who'd finished their dinner? Was it someone who had done the yard work? Was it someone's turn? And Wait, it you mean an extra piece of dessert? <laughs> there, there never was extra dessert at my house, so we never. Right, well. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So one story Michael would tell is that his parents basically were tired of him and his brother fighting over dessert, so they basically said, "Michael, you cut the you cut the dessert in two and your brother gets to choose. And Michael said, today he can still do with, with geometric precision exactly <laughs> how to cut it. But the thing is that all of these decisions, who gets the last piece of pie, those are ownership rules. We don't think about it that way, but they're ownership rules and they're, they're basically exposing our values. You know, What are you going to reward by granting ownership, in this case, to just a piece of cherry pie? Well, I also liked it because it brought up the whole American thing of, you know, it's as, it's as American as cherry pie, certainly. Or is I didn't it think about that. That's good. <laughs> okay. Well, um, you, you say in the book that there are six simple stories that everyone uses to claim everything. Right. Right. They are first in time. I had right. it first. Possession. I have it now. Labor. I worked for it. Attachment. It's attached to something I own. Self-ownership. It's my body and family, I inherited it. So can you tell us one of your favorite examples in the book and which ownership claim it, it illustrates? Yeah, so um, let me first give you a story where you've got conflicting ones that I can tell you sort of my favorite, my favorite story. So a conflicting one uh, is just you go to a playground, right? And you see these two kids fighting over a plastic shovel. And all you hear is mine, 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 right? Because whenever you go to a playground, that's all you hear. Right. It's not one of the interesting things we found actually is that in every culture around the world, mine is one of the first words that kids speak. It doesn't matter what culture it is. <laughs> so we, we hear mine, but there's something different going on. Uh, the question is, how do they both get it? And, and, you know, imagine, for example, one kid had the shovel, put it down, turned around to do something, turned back, and another kid was holding it. We hear mine versus mine, but what really is happening is two battling stories. One is saying first in time, I had it first. Right. The other one is saying current possession, it's mine because I'm holding on to it. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that because one of the main points of the book is that ownership's always up for grabs. It's always sort of battling, battling stories. But my favorite story in the book actually uh, happened to me personally. Uh, we, we split up the book into basically each saying um, of the six you mentioned is its own chapter, but we flip it on its head. Instead of first come, first served, it's first come, last served. Uh, to sort of show how these how these how these ownership <laughs> intuitions are manipulated, so I uh, I was going from American University early in my career to Duke. Uh, I was very excited, great law school, great university. I'm meeting with the dean, uh, and she says we can talk about salary, but basketball tickets are off the table. Hmm. And I thought to myself, okay, uh, <laughs> it's like, what, what? okay, fine, let's talk salary. Uh, what, what I didn't realize was that at Duke, basketball is the activity, going to the basketball game. It's old indoor stadium, very small. Um, and if it's hard for faculty to get tickets, 
it's much harder for the students. And so there's this tradition that's emerged called camp out. So camp out is the third weekend of September every year. It's for graduate students. And you have to show up if you're a grad student Friday night, starting at 6 p.m. You register. And then until Sunday morning, you have to be essentially within five minutes of the table because they'll blow a horn at irregular periods. You've got to run and check in. And it's this massive party for most of it until folks are just exhausted. Uh, the business students and law students, they'll basically pay to rent U-Hauls and RVs and stuff. The English and philosophy students basically lie on the ground and hope it doesn't rain. But the thing is, you, you sort of at the end of that, you're then entered into a lottery to see if you get tickets. And I just thought, this is just bizarre. And my research assistant said it was the best part of his time at Duke. I thought, what are you talking about? And when I started teaching property, I realized this was a brilliant ownership scheme, right? So how do most universities with good basketball teams allocate tickets? They'll have first come, first serve. They'll have a lottery, um, maybe even an auction, something like that. Um, Duke, though, doesn't, what you need to focus on with Duke is they have a scarce resource, which is basketball tickets. There are far fewer than students want. So what does Duke want? And it turns out Duke wants what are called Cameron crazies. These are students who will paint their faces blue and will stand and scream for an hour or an hour and a half of a game. And if you think about it, the very best way to identify these Cameron crazies is to have them go sleepless for 36 hours <laughs> in, the same, in the same spot. It really, it's, it's a brilliant allocation scheme and uh, it creates this bonding experience, this sense of community. So that's, the, that, that, that's my, my, my favorite story because it, it makes no sense unless you think about it through the, through the lens of ownership. Well, I also thought it was interesting because you, you go on to say that Duke has really effectively divvied up lots of different ways to allocate those tickets. And each one is targeting a specific group all to Duke's benefit. So they've figured out how to sort of target each area and make it work best for them. So yeah, exactly. So for the wealthy alumni, they obviously are not gonna camp out. Right. Wealthy alumni, there's something called the Iron Dukes. Yeah. So you pay $8,000 to be a member of this August club, and then you wait for seats to become available. And on top of your 8,000 every year, you also pay for the season tickets. No, it's actually, it's, it's like a lot of the stories in the book. I, I found myself thinking that they were brilliant and diabolical at the same time. Yeah. You know? and, and Duke basically understands that we end up calling ownership engineering, yeah. which is you can shape the way people get things to get them to the things that you want to do. Yeah, that seems to be the theme throughout the book, which was not lost on me. Um, I thought we'd actually start to uh, with a story um, since we're with Chaucer's, a bookstore. Um, can you tell us about uh, the woman who had books on her Kindle? Yeah, so this I was Lynn. That was fascinating. So this is Lynn Nygaard. So, and this is in the chapter "Possession is One Tenth of the Law." So, when you go to Amazon to buy your Kindle book which you shouldn't do, you should go to Chaucer's and buy exactly. the book solid. But if you're Especially weak- after you listen to this story. That's right. If you're weak and you want, and you want to get the, get the <laughs> ebook, um, you click buy now. And it's not a coincidence it says buy now. It's not a coincidence that it's in the shape of a shopping cart. What Amazon and online vendors are trying to do is to trigger our hardwired sense of actually owning something or really some thing. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, there was a study was done at University of Pennsylvania last year, 85% of those polled said they believe that when they buy a Kindle, for example, or an iTunes, it's the same thing as having the physical thing. And they're wrong. It's not. So what happened to Lynn Nygaard, she travels a lot, um, Norwegian, uh, and she found that her books just disappeared one day. And she had of 40 of them, right? There 40, were 40 okay. books yeah. on her Kindle. Just disappeared one day. Uh, and she called, got in touch with Amazon, and they basically said, yeah, that's part of the agreement. Sorry. <laughs> and then, and you know, tell why, right? No, no. Well, I mean, originally they thought, she thought there was some kind of mix up or something, but they were not very forthcoming. So a friend of hers posted it, and it, it, it sort of the post went viral. And amazingly, the next day, the books reappeared. <laughs> Uh, but imagine for a moment, I mean, if you had bought a book at Chaucer's, someone from Chaucer's couldn't go into your house, take the book off the shelf, and then leave. But in Amazon's terms of service, they actually can do exactly that. And there's a real sort of fundamental, it's almost an epical shift happening uh, from owning things to owning a stream of ones and zeros, right? Mm -hmm. So this is my, this is my iPhone. Um, what do I own? I basically own a plastic brick. 
because what matters in the iPhone is not the iPhone. What matters is the operating system, which I don't own, and what's stored on the phone, which I don't own. Uh, and it's very interesting in terms, if you look at terms of service, I own actually nothing except, except this brick. Um, and what's fascinating is that if you, again, you go to a playground, um, there have been studies that show this, when kids are fighting over something on the playground, it's never a song or a joke or, or, or something that is intangible. Um, they fight over things that are tangible. And there's this huge gap right now that, that between what we think we own and what we actually own. And the phrase we use in the book and other folks have used as well is you bought it, but you don't own it. And this hasn't simply happened with, with Lynn Nygaard. So one of the, the, the most famous examples was Amazon again, and the book 1984 yeah. was removed from people's Kindle accounts, <laughs> which is of course exactly what Big Brother would do. Now I'm not saying Amazon does this frequently or Apple does it frequently, but the point is they can do it. And think about what you can't do with a Kindle book. You can't share it. You can't cut it up and, and post it various things. It's very hard to market. It's just, a, it's a different, it's a different relationship uh, with the book. And yet we assume, well, it says buy now, it says a shopping cart, it must be the same. Well, and that makes me think of the story that you tell about Netflix, where the whole idea of Netflix and the code and, and we all think that we shouldn't be sharing the code, but that Netflix knows that everybody does share your password. Yeah, so this is a, this is a fairly, uh, I, I, I won't call it a disturbing story. It's a pretty eye-opening story. So uh, when Michael and I teach property, we ask our students, these are law students, how many of you either use a shared HBO password that's not your own or know someone, right? Hypothetically, right. you know someone. Every single hand in the room goes up. Now, these are law students, okay? Right. This is illegal, right? This is not legal-ish, it's illegal. Uh, and, you know, arguably it's a federal crime. There's actually a federal statute on They this. were just raising their hand for their friends. They just knew somebody <laughs> that did. I would I'm never sure. do that. But yeah. here's the thing. So, so, why, so why do we do it, right? Why do we do it? Um, we do it for two reasons. First of all, everyone else seems to do it. But second of all, HBO is actually encouraging us to do it. Um, so the, the CEO of HBO a few years ago, a guy called Richard Plepler, he said in an interview that went viral, he said, our goal is to, is, to, is to train video addicts. That's the term he used. And the idea basically is he is building brand. He wants more and more people to watch Game of Thrones and other HBO shows. And everyone knows it's not exactly kosher. And right. the idea is that as they get wealthier, um, they'll actually go legit and, and actually pay and pay for the password. Netflix, very interestingly right now, you mentioned Netflix, they're doing a beta right now. And some of you folks watching tonight may have seen this if you use Netflix and more than one account, they'll put up a gentle reminder saying, you may want to know that you're not supposed to use this in more than one device. They haven't decided whether to stick uh -huh. with the HBO model or to get tougher. Now they learned from something that happened in the early 2000s. So the recording industry, you may recall, they brought tens of thousands of lawsuits against college students for a right. lot of money because they were eagerly downloading. Uh, two things happened. First of all, illegal downloading continued. Second of all, they learned the lesson. It's not good to piss off your clients, <laughs> your fans, right? So HBO watched and they learned, but it's not just HBO. Um, so for instance, if you look at uh, Louis Vuitton bags or Rolex watches, you know, you go to Times Square and you can get one. It's amazing. It's only $30, right? What a deal. Now, you might think that they want to shut this down. Uh, and it turns out there was a fascinating study done by business school. They found that 40% of those who bought the knockoff uh, Rolex watches ended up buying the real thing later. And so what they're finding is that the knockoffs actually are training consumers for what they should aspire to later on. And just one last example of this idea of sort of tolerated theft is what we call it. Right in the book, it's a business strategy, is Disney. So Disney is, uh, is known across the industry as, as being incredibly litigious, you know, defend the mouse. And the reason for that is Walt Disney actually originally, his original character, he lost, right? And after, and after that, you know, it started with Mortimer the, Ma Mortimer the Mouse, then became Mickey. They're called, the, the lawyers are called the Disnoids because they just go after you. There are these famous scenes where they go after, we talked about in the book, they go after daycare centers. If you have a Disney mural and daycare center, forget about it, all right? You can't do it. Um, Disney did that for a long time and they realized that it was not great for business, but they realized something else as well. So 
there are a lot of pirate sites, pirate fan sites for Disney that basically produce Disney merchandise. It's totally illegal, right? It's unlicensed. Uh, but what Disney realized is this is crowdsourcing R&D. So one example we talk about, there's a woman, her, her, her on, I don't know what her real name is, her online name is Bibbidi Bobbidi Brook. Actually, maybe I'm being unfair. That may be her real name. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's what she said her name was. And she came up with a pair of Mickey Mouse ears that are rose sequins. Uh, and they were a big hit on her, we on her website. Disney took the idea, put it in the fan shops, you know, the official fan shops for Disney, and they sold out. So yeah. Disney actually has backed off now because they're trying to basically take advantage of this tolerated theft. HBO, it's building brand. Uh, um, Rolex, it's basically sort of channeling aspiring consumers. In Disney, it's outsourcing, crowdsourcing R&D. Hmm. Okay, let's move into let's move into your. I can do this all night. Well, so can I. Um, but your your uh, area of expertise has always been water, right? So I was really interested to read the chapter or the story about the Italian immigrant that moved to California Central Valley in the 1920s and thought, "Wow, this is fertile soil. I'm so happy to be able to plant here." He dug a well, and everything was going wonderfully in the beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about what that situation has evolved into? Yeah, so the family are the, are the Patiglianis. Um, and they, as you said, came here in the 1920s and they were a very similar story. They weren't Okies, but similar, you know, sort of Grapes of Wrath movement out to the Central Valley. Uh, and their, their story is very similar to many immigrant families that came to the Central Valley. It was a fabulous story, right? The most productive and uh, most profitable agricultural sector in the world. The problem though, is that they were mining the groundwater. They were pumping it up faster than it was being replenished. Um, and as a result, during this last drought, uh, a lot of wells started going dry. And there was a huge problem really of, of environmental justice in the sense that many of the poor Latino communities, their wells are basically running dry and, and ran dry because the water table went below them and they couldn't afford to dig deeper. So the particular audience are complaining because they're spending up to a million dollars to put the well deeper, which is a real problem. But you've got these other families in places like Monson, California, where they basically got a truck in water or hope water um, mm -hmm. is trucked in. And it's, 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 a, it's a terrible problem. And it, it got so bad, the state actually changed the law, which people thought would never happen. And they're basically, it's called SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And they're basically trying to redo how we think of groundwater. In Texas, it's even worse. So in Texas, uh, there's no law for groundwater. It's called the rule of capture. And so this is guy we talk about, um, Bart Cipriano. Uh, and um, his family had been in this place for generations, West Texas, and the Ozarka Spring Company comes in and they put in a- By Nestle, right? Uh, later on by Nestle, right? Okay. At the time it wasn't, but you're right. They're owned by a Nestle now, evil Nestle. Uh, and. Um, uh, and they put a diesel pump and started pumping. And one day Cipriano finds his, his well is run dry. His neighbor's well has run dry. So they sue. They say, how can you do that? This water was mine, it was in my well. And you took it by, by putting the well deeper. You basically sucked the water from either side. Texas Supreme Court says, too bad. That's the rule. If you don't like it, go to the legislature uh, and, and, and change the rule. So you know these, 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 the, the, the key point is that rules of ownership oftentimes are created when the resource is abundant. Well, I thought that was interesting too, though. In Texas, there's this situation with the water where the Supreme Court says fine, but that's not true for oil oil and mineral rights in Texas, right? So that's right, that's right. Just being who has the most powerful lobbyists and lawyers, it seems to me. I think that's right, but also it's a question of realizing when the resource becomes scarce. Hmm. So people realize early on with the wildcatters um, that if you put too many, if you site too many drills, you lose oil pressure and a lot of the oil stays underground. They realized that very quickly. And so yeah. they changed how they actually drill for oil to, to make it sensible. But Only I mean, didn't they, didn't they realize that in Central California too, though? I mean, you, you mentioned in the book that in some parts of the Central Valley, the, the aquifers were actually, you know, lowering the, 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 the land by 28 feet. That's oh yeah, and, and, and more. I mean, sunk 28 feet because the aquifer was just drying up. Yeah, and that and, would have certainly, you know, alerted everybody to the fact that that uh, all was not right. Yeah, and you get this problem. It's called the tragedy of the commons. And the problem is the individual incentive of each farmer is to keep pumping. Right. 
because if you stop pumping to try to preserve the aquifer and your neighbors keep pumping, then you're a chump. Right. Um, and so it's individually rational, it's collectively disastrous, which is why you need, need the government and environmental lawyers like me to step <laughs> in. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, one of my other favorite stories. So you have a chapter on the idea that it's mined because it's been in my family for a long time. So I love the title of this chapter. You call it the meek shall inherit very little. Uh, you talk about how income inequality has widened and that one response is to impose new taxes on the wealth, but you offer an alternative response. Instead of focusing on just taxing wealth accumulation, you suggest that we address the hidden flip side, wealth transmission. Yeah. Tell us about South Dakota, Jim. It's, it's unreal. So 40% of wealth in the United States is inherited, right? So most wealth is generated, but not as well much as we might think is generated. So this is important because uh, if you're concerned about wealth inequality being locked in for generation after generation, that matters. Yeah. So South Dakota, this is the shocker. South Dakota is the go-to place in the world for sheltering money. Yeah, if I'd like you to just say that again, because I think for people that haven't been able to read your book yet, just say that again. Yeah, South Dakota, the home of Mount Rushmore and the Sturgis Motorcycle Festival is now the go-to place in the world for sheltering money. It crushes the Cayman Islands. It crushes Switzerland. Uh, and no one in South Dakota knows this. No one anywhere in the United States <laughs> knows this, I would suggest. Well, we published an op-ed in the Washington Post, so a few people <laughs> know this, but no. I did actually want to um, see if we could link to that op-ed in the Washington Post. So if we can't end up doing it during this session, please, I'm hoping everybody does look it up. It's under your name and Michael Heller's. It's a really interesting piece in the Washington. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so the thing that's stunning, I won't go into a lot of detail. It gets into sort of trust in the state's law and the rule against perpetuities and such. But the bottom line is they created through very small technical changes to trust in the state's law. They created these things called dynasty trust and other types of trust that essentially mean that wealth passes on from generation to generation without being taxed. It allows, and, and, and the thing is, if you are super rich, and I don't mean the 1%, I mean the 1% of the 1%, you already know this. Right. If you're not in that group, you've never heard about it. And for this group, it's not only that you can pass on wealth from generation to generation, essentially untaxed, you also are essentially judgment proof because you don't have assets. Your trust holds the assets. So if you want to stiff your business partner, stiff your spouse, stiff your kids, uh, stiff someone you hit by a car, um, you can do that if you're in South Dakota. For folks after this, Google Dynasty Trust South Dakota, and you will see website after website basically advertising your money. And the thing is, you don't have to live in South Dakota. You don't have to visit South Dakota. The people who are shuffling your money have nothing to do with South Dakota. And the tragedy of all this is not a single road is being built in South Dakota from this. Not a single book is being purchased for a South Dakota school. The only people who are benefiting is a very small coterie of lobbyists and lawyers and bankers and the legislators who are being, who are being lobbied. And it's um, not just that the people of South Dakota are not benefiting from it. It's that the people that live in the states where these people actually live and in theory owe state tax are not getting the benefit of those tax dollars as well, right? That's exactly right. So basically they're, they're being sheltered from taxes by moving all their assets to South Dakota. And the estimates are anywhere from three, $300 billion to $2 trillion. South Dakota, like Switzerland and the Cayman Islands is very good at secrecy. Wait a second. So those numbers that you just rattled off, the estimates are that's how much money is there or that's how much money is being sheltered? I mean, that's there. how much money is lost in tax. No, no, it's there, is okay. there. But obviously that generates yeah, a lot yeah. of tax. And so we're all getting stiffed as well because the states these folks live in, a lot of probably live in California, that the state doesn't get their, doesn't get their taxes. And, and the federal government doesn't. Or, or the state, that's right. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. one of the things we, that we say in the book, I think it's really important for folks listening is to realize that it's, it's a bit of a paradox. Law is both overrated and underrated. <laughs> it's overrated because the vast majority of ownership rules that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis have nothing to do with the law, right? If you're at Gelson's, right, after buying the book at Chaucer's um, <laughs> and you're in, the, you're in the, the line, okay, and you've got a, 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 a shopping cart full of things, uh, right. And I walk by, or someone else walks by, you don't know actually, and they say, candy ginger, I was looking all over for that, and takes it, and then looks again, 
and says, buttermilk, I need that too, right? How would you feel if someone reached into your shopping cart and took out items, right? You'd be outraged, right? right? Totally outraged. Yep. That's not a, no one's going to go to court over that, right? The vast majority of, they're not. The vast majority <laughs> of things where you wait in line and stuff, even here, they're not going to. The vast majority of interactions we have are not legal interactions. The, can someone lean their, their, their airplane seat back or not? Who gets the shared armrest? Right. Okay, but so but that does lead me to the next question. I was going to ask about airlines because we're, you know, Southwest Airlines is now in Santa Barbara, which is very exciting. <laughs> um, I was actually there's a that. Southwest story we can tell also. Well, I, I was hoping you'd do that, but just to link it back to Gelson's, I was realizing that you know, for a lot of these situations, I think many of us would look to the establishment that we're visiting or the airline that we've paid money to to solve those disputes for us. Gelson's would come in and say, "Hey, you can't take that buttermilk. You can't take that ginger," and and the person would be sort of shamed in a way to conform well, to society's norms, right? And it seems to me that we're now coming into this place where not only are the businesses that we're giving our money to are not wanting to get into the middle of these these situations but public shaming is getting harder and harder i mean so airline seats great example it used to be that if you um uh, held held two seats open on southwest or whatever you might get you know publicly shamed you'd have somebody say hey that's not fair and it seems that now it just becomes an immediate conflict and southwest airlines isn't stepping in which is my way of segueing you into the story of southwest. yeah i mean I, I mean public shaming i think actually is still pretty powerful um in, in most cases not in all cases for sure but where i'd push back a little bit is when you said gelson's would say hey don't do that yeah there's a very good chance gelson's would say we're not gonna not gonna get in the middle of this. So let's look at Southwest because that's actually a, a business strategy. Yeah, yeah. So the folks listening, Southwest basically has three different boarding groups, uh, A, B, and C. And depending on when you actually check in, starting 24 hours beforehand, you're somewhere between basically one and 240, depending on which group, or 180, depending on which group you're in. Um, okay. You can also pay to be an early bird. So that's the first. That's A, one through 30. A group goes first, B, then C, and it's a remarkably efficient system. People basically self, self line up. You don't have these sort of semi-precious metals and gems. You know, now we're going to look at Ruby. Now we're going to look at, you know, yes. spandex or whatever. I mean, everyone's right. got their own, right. own special group. Um, and so the, the, the challenge, though, and there's a whole bulletin board about this with people outraged. And, and, and it, Wendy, it's what you were talking about. What happens when someone who gets in early to an exit row, exit right. row, uh, and they save a seat, or Not they save fair. two seats for Not riffraff, fair. riffraff who are coming in in group C, right? So it turns out that there was a the dispute over this that actually became national news. A guy called Stu Weinshanker uh, and his wife, uh, they travel a lot, and they basically paid to be early birders. So they were probably, I don't know, A25, A26 something. They got on the flight. Their preferred seats are exit row aisle, so sitting across the aisle from one another. Um, they get on board and they find there's a person sitting in a middle seat, got in ahead of them in the exit row, and has put an iPad on the exit seat, uh, on, the, on the aisle seat. And so Weinshanker goes up um, and the person says, well, I'm saving that for my boyfriend who's getting First on later. All, I just have to say, why didn't she put the iPad in the middle seat? I mean, if you're going to save a seat, wouldn't you say, I mean, uh, anyway, go ahead. Not a sophisticated seat saver. I think we can all agree about okay. that. Okay. So Weinshanker says, well, you know, I'm sorry, but this is where I want to sit. And I'm an early birder. Uh, why don't you take the laptop and put it by the window? And she says, no, no, I want to save it here. So Weinshanker, and everyone says he was polite, picks up the iPad, hands it to her, sits down, uh, and she bursts into tears uh, and says that he bullied her. Uh, so it becomes national national right. news. And there's headlines saying, who's the jerk? <laughs> uh, and it turns out that there's this poll, and the poll is split almost exactly 50-50. Wow. About whether you should be able to save seats or not. So, so why am I telling the story? Southwest has a very specific policy that they will not get involved. Right? So they, basically, they've got this sort of business strategy where they're the easygoing, cool airline. You can get in early. Uh, and they just don't want to get in the middle of this thing. And when can, you they, say they, what they mean is they won't put their flight attendants in the middle, right? They, because well, the they flight do, attendants one. In, in, in a sense, they do, because people complain to the flight attendants and the flight right. attendants say, but the thing is that Southwest could very easily create a rule. No seat saving. Right. Uh, you can save one seat. 
uh, no seat saving uh, in the exit row, right? There are very many ways that Southwest could solve this immediately, and they don't. And the reason they don't is that they're relying on good manners and politeness among the customers to work it out themselves. And hopefully the customers get angry at each other and not angry at the airline. Well, I was gonna ask you about the um, reclining seat because that's a big one in, in our family. We have tall people that um, have a hard time with leg room as it continues to shrink on airlines. But Michael, I don't, I don't know if you can hear, but it's now 40 minutes past the hour. And I think that's when we were turning it over to Q and A. Is that your, was that what you thought too, Jim? I'll follow your lead. I, I think we're doing well. I think we should keep going. Okay. And what's yeah, your and, and, and folks have, then we'll turn it over to Q&A. Okay. And if folks and have you, questions, they can type in the Q&A and we'll see them. Okay. So um, great if stuff, anybody so. that's here joining us, just uh, use the little chat feature down at the bottom. Or do, I'm, I'm hoping oh, you Q&A. Q&A. Okay. Oh, the Q&A. Sorry. Yes. On the right. So do that and then we will... Um, answer some questions. But then since we're on airlines, why don't we continue then with the the seat and the reclining seat and all of that. So yeah. can you talk about that controversy now. So this is the anchor story of the entire book. This is the first story we tell in the book. And basically, um, again, this, this uh, big guy, Stu Beach, travels a lot. He has a, uh, a middle row, a uh, middle seat row 12, flight from Newark to Denver. He gets on, Flight takes off, puts down the tray table. And before he takes out his laptop, begins to work, he takes out two plastic clamps that are called the knee defenders. And he puts them in, they're 21 bucks on the internet. And they say, we, you know, we, we defend your knees so you don't have to. <laughs> uh, and they basically lock the seat in front in place. When the woman in front tries to recline, she can't. She figures out what's going on. She asks him to remove them. And according to the stories, he's slower than she wanted. And so she slams the seat back, the knee defenders pop out, laptop is shoved into his lap. He jams the seat back up, puts the knee defenders back in. She then takes her glass of water, turns on and throws it in his face. We don't actually know how this would have uh, ended up because at that point, the captain executed an emergency landing and took them to Chicago where they were escorted from the plane, presumably abashed, yes. right? And so, why is this the, the anchor story for the book? What does this have to do with ownership? Well, a few things. The first is, why do they each feel that they're on the right? So one of the arguments uh, is if you put is attachment. Uh, I own it because it's attached to something I own. So if you sit there with a button on your seat, the idea is if I can recline into that space, it's attached to my seat, it's mine. Right. The other is possession. What Beach says, it's current possession. I basically control the space. I'm using it. I was here first. When you lean in, it's trespass. Uh, and so you've got these battling, these battling stories. Um, so that's, that's sort of one, one aspect of this. Second aspect, why is this happening now? We didn't used to be fights over this. What's happening now for two reasons. The first is we use tray tables differently than we used to, mm -hmm. right? Because we use them now basically for, for laptops and entertainment. So this space didn't used to be very valuable. Now it's valuable. And it's even scarcer because airlines are shrinking what's called the pitch which is a distance between seats. Everyone knows this, right? One inch of reduced distance between seats gives you an extra row of six seats in the back oh. of the plane. It's a lot of money. And it used to be about 34, 35 inches. Now it's 28, 29, 29 inches. Um, so the airline basically is, is, is basically, you know, creating more space for conflict. But here's the real, the key to this. This is an ownership conflict because the battle is over the wedge of space behind the seat. Who right. controls that wedge, the recliner? or the knee defender. The airline is selling the same wedge of space twice. It's selling it to me to recline and to you to push it back up, right? Airlines could have a rule if they wanted to. In fact, often, oftentimes airlines do have a rule. You're allowed to recline, but they don't tell you. And by making it uncomfortable, uh, there's a more of a market for economy plus in business class. Right. But also they're doing the same thing Southwest is doing. They are pushing the conflict onto the passengers. So we get angry at each other instead of get, getting angry at the real owner of all this, which is the airline. But here's, here's the thing that I find so amazing about this story. So the exact same thing is happening uh, in the battle over the internet. So, you know, if you were, if, once we're traveling again, right, and you're gonna go to Burlington, right, to, to, to visit family, um, 
So you go to kayak orbits or something and look into Burlington flights, and all of a sudden you start seeing, no matter where you go on the web, these ads start following you about wonderful Vermont, things to eat, places to stay, things to right. see, right? What a coincidence, right? Yeah. Now, obviously, it's not a coincidence. What happened is that your click stream, your looks and your likes, those are tracked. And the travel websites are selling those to advertisers, and they're very valuable because they actually know, know a lot about you. Um, it turns out that per person, uh, our, our click streams are worth over $100 every year in terms of the overall, yeah, in terms of the overall economic value of that. Um, who owns the click stream, right? Yeah. The Amazon and Orbit say it's ours because of attachment. You know, your clicks are attached to our website. They also might use the labor story. We put in the labor to build these cool websites. And if you leave tracks here, we're gonna take them. We can push back though. We can say self-ownership. The click stream is part of who I am. Right now, except for California and parts of Europe, which have some protection, it's totally up in the air. And so what's happening is these big uh, internet uh, giants are basically just taking it. Right. A new resource, it's a, it's a new value and they're just taking it. But we can push back once we know what the stories are. Well, and there's a parallel to DNA, right? With the 23andMe, you talk about that. It seems like a very similar situation. Where Very similar, right? So ever wonder why the tests are so cheap? Right. Well, the tests are so cheap because you're the product, right? right? <laughs> they essentially right. are bundling your genome with millions of others. And they have these huge databases that they essentially lease to drug companies for tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to help them basically develop new drugs and such. We're not paid for it. Right. So no, they don't even sell it, they lease it. They know enough to know that they're not going to sell it. They just lease it. They, they lease it. access to it. That's right, for research okay. projects. And what's fascinating is the way it's framed. So in the U.S., we think about uh, access to our genome as a privacy issue, right? It's private, yeah. keep it private. Uh, and 23andMe, uh, they, they're very happy about that because they don't really care about the privacy. They care about ownership. Right. right? Because what you could say is instead of privacy, how about I own my genome? And when you get money uh, from Merck, right, or from some of these other pharmaceutical companies, Smith, Klein, Beecham, um, how about paying me? Right. Right. Because I'm leasing my genome right. to you. Right. And there actually are, are some startup uh, 23andMe-like companies that have that business model. That's what I found interesting about the book, too, was you do mention some of the companies that seem to be trying to, to give us more choices, you know, that we can become better consumers and ultimately better sellers of our product. I mean, the other line that I thought was so appropriate in the book is, if an app is free, you are the product. Right. <laughs> I think it's so true. And of it, course, it, I'm I mean, a phone full of free apps, so. The other thing that's interesting is, I think we don't write about this in the book, but I've, I've thought about it quite a bit. I think this is generational as well. I think our generation is much more concerned about keeping our stuff ours than our kids. Yes. Our kids just frankly couldn't care less. They just give away personal information because they want the cool apps. Yeah, I think that I think it is true that there's a generational thing that they've grown up. It's trading convenience for privacy, right? Right. But, but the thing is, it's not just privacy. That's the point. You could frame it as ownership and say oh, you're right, basically right. giving away a valuable, right. a valuable product. You're playing well, their game when you talk about privacy. You know, you're right. And and I think that once people figure that out, it'll it'll change the game, even for the younger generation, when they realize that they could probably be paid for some of these things that they've thought of as privacy issues, um, if they reframe it as, as property issues. Yeah, maybe that's the new wave. And, and one of the things that comes up a lot, again, once you start looking around the world to the prison of ownership, a lot of things that kind of snap into focus. So when ownership is ambiguous, right? So think about Airbnb. Think about Uber, mm -hmm. you know, can you, does ownership of your house, your apartment mean you can rent it out overnight? Does ownership of your car mean you can basically get paid to drive people around? Right. Um, it's not clear. And that's basically Airbnb and Uber and these other startups basically said, then we'll just take it. Right. Uh, and the hope is that the law will follow the practice. So water law in the United States and in, in Western United States, I'd say prior appropriation, that basically started in mining camps. It was totally informal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when the territories became states, the federal government said, we will respect your property rights systems, your ownership systems. Huh. That's, that's why we have this crazy system for water rights in the West. I mean, it's stupid uh, yeah. given the current needs of the 21st century. It wasn't stupid in the 1840s, 1850s in gold mining camps. 
All right, well, now I see that we are 10 minutes before seven. So why don't we start uh, seeing if there are any questions here. Can you read the questions? Yeah, I think we can skip yeah. the one from the Sarko clown. <laughs> <laughs> No, I want to know who's what actor is going to play in the <laughs> movie version of the book. You know the answer to that, Jim, right? James? Yes. James. Uh, of course. <laughs> James yeah. Reed. James Reed. Play the movie. Thank you for the prompt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then Betsy Spaulding. Hi, Betsy. Um, you want to read her question out loud or you want to? Yeah, it says water is becoming a limited resource due to climate change and other reasons as well. How is ownership rules of aquifers gonna change in California in the future? So part of this builds off what we're talking about with, with Sigma, which is in the past, water in aquifers has been essentially first come first serve, it's the rule of capture. Um, they're just starting to change by, you know, by 2030, 2040, it's supposed to be a different, um, a different system. I think the bigger challenge is what we have for surface waters. Right, so basically the system of prior appropriation I was describing, it says first in time, first in right. And so you got this crazy situation where the Imperial Irrigation District, uh, which is in this incredibly dry, dry area, they were the very first sort of irrigation district to take a lot of water from the Colorado. And so they're basically growing alfalfa and mm. cotton in the desert, which is nuts, but they're doing it because they can, right? The water is so cheap that they basically can grow whatever they want. The problem is that once ownership rules become uh, stuck in place, become sticky, it's very hard to unstick them, right? You have to pay a lot, you've got vested interests who don't want anything to change. Uh, and so it just politically becomes extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah. Well, if anybody else has any questions, they can type it into the Q and A. If not, we've got another couple of minutes and I do have one other question for you. Um, it's, uh, well, I have a question and then I do have a closing statement. So we probably get to the question. I, I don't know, I thought it was, I thought it was the, the chapter on your body, our bodies, ourselves, not really. Um, I, this idea that states, you know, that, that, that you can cross state lines and your rights completely change. It never really occurred to me, especially when you're talking about all the um, news around fertility issues, you know, so as, if you want to hire a surrogate, you can do that in some states, but not in others. If you want to, right. I, I don't know, I've, I've, I have found that really interesting and I'm curious, do you think that there's ever gonna be a point when lawmakers are gonna say, we need to standardize this? Because it seems kind of crazy that you can- I, I, I think it's hard, because one of the things that's, most, that, that's really interesting about that chapter more generally is that your control of your body parts is not a red blue right. issue. It's not a north south. Right. issue. New Jersey, New York have very different rules. Michigan and Wisconsin have very different rules. And essentially what we think is going on is that, is that you're basically trying to, um, we, we, we talk about the, 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 the um, classic version of ownership is an on-off switch. And we think that's really misleading. Yeah. You're much better off thinking of ownership as a dimmer. And at one end of the dimmer uh, is basically uh, the sacred which is this is simply not marketable. Slavery is a classic example. You simply cannot sell yourself into slavery. That's, that's the sacred. The opposite is what we call the profane, which would be you know, selling your hair, right? Or selling a potato, right? People don't really object to that. The problem is there's a lot that's in between. So why can we sell blood plasma, but we can't sell a spare kidney, right? right? And you know, there are all kinds of concerns about this. The one is that um, you don't want to commodify, you don't want to commodify the body. One is you don't want to allow poor people to be taken advantage of. Um, but there are ways to get around all that, to address all that through ownership engineering. The problem is, and the reason I think you're never going to have uniform rules about, about body parts is part of it is our understanding um, of, of, what, of what matters changes tremendously. So, so for example. Um, the issue of, of, uh, of surrogacy, right? Gestational mm -hmm. surrogacy. Prior to IVF, prior to being able to actually fertilize an egg and sperm outside the body, it was biblical, right? Basically, you know, the, the, as in the Bible, you had, you know, uh, man had sex with another woman as Abraham does. Um, and that was, that was surrogacy. It's very different now, right? With, with yeah. gay couples, with infertile couples. Um, 
And, and yet the, the, we sort of still have these, uh, a lot of people in this debate still think of it as a sort of the biblical, the biblical model. And so one of the things we talk a lot about is the importance of reasoning by analogy. What's the actual analogy that you're, that you're focusing on? Um, and so, you know, another example uh, is, um, you know, prostitution, right? So prostitution is legal in Nevada. Uh, some graduate students uh, hosted what they called virginity auctions. Um, and people just went off the wall, even right. though, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's a form of prostitution, but virginity brings in this, this whole other kind of baggage, right, right. which is cultural. Um, mm -hmm. And then you get these, these charity auctions uh, where someone can kiss Charlize Theron or George Clooney for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. No, one's, no one's worried about that. Right. So we're just, we're very inconsistent uh, about all these issues. I know, I know we're running out of time. We are um, running out of time. But, and I did, I did just want to say that when in, in closing, because I love the way you closed the book, which was you say, whether you're waiting in line, surfing the web or squeezed in your airline seat, ask yourself whose hand is on the remote control, who gets what and why. And I, and I think that sums it up perfectly. So, um, Michael, oh, Oh, there, we have a question about signed copies. And I did want to say that, yeah, if you okay. uh, haven't purchased a book yet, please do go and purchase it. And uh, uh, Jim and Michael will work out when Jim can go and sign them and have them there ready for you, or we'll, we'll make sure you can get a signed copy. So, uh, and, 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 if you, and if you let Michael know, I can also personalize it. Yes, yeah, that's great. So just go ahead and email me at events at chaucersbooks.com and we can definitely make sure that it happens. Wendy Reed, James Saltzman, this was an amazing conversation. You, you both have amazing chemistry and Jim, mine, how the hidden rules of ownership control our lives. Well, that's my copy right back there. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna buy that one. So thank you both for joining us and everyone, thank you both. Thank you for coming to this event. Thank you. And Jim, I wish you the best on, on the book in the future. And congratulations on getting national exposure with the New Yorker and the New York Times. Great, it's well-deserved because it's, it's a wonderful book. So yeah. thank you, everyone. And have thank a nice everyone. and safe evening. Great. Good night. Good night.